Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Let's get started. Yeah, so today we are going to have actually a very exciting lecture because we are going to revisit our view about what are data in our database and what do they really mean and how can we actually extract insight from those data. If you look at what we have in the last 14 lectures, essentially the process that we have been talking about is actually by treating your database as the storage of your factual knowledge, right? So here is one database instance contains a whole bunch of relations. Each relation contains a whole bunch of facts that you're assuming is true in this universe, right? And then given those, the process that uh, we have to extract insight from it is actually try to take as input this database instance and output a new relation. And we call such a function a query. Right? And we talk about so many different ways that can write this query from a theoretical perspective. We have relational calculus, we have relational algebra, right? On the practical scenario, we have your SQL query, right? So I think everyone knows how to write those at this moment. But if you look at this view, right, it's essentially all mute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Let me mute all. Okay, yeah. So if you look at this view, right? So underneath the cover, we are actually taking a pretty logical based view of a database. It actually simply contains the interpretation of some logical system. But this is not the only way of looking at data. And uh, having relational query is also not the only way to get insight from your data. So in this lecture, we are going to go through an alternative view about what data are inside your database. Instead of taking this logical based view, in this lecture, we are going to take a more statistical view. What do we mean by that? Instead of having in the database all the facts that we are assuming to be true, we start to think about the database contains a whole bunch of examples that happen in history. And what we want to do is whether we can take as input those his uh, historical record, those samples from some distribution, and the reason about the future, or reason about the property of the distribution that we never see at this moment. And if you take this view, the way that you can do to actually get insight from your data, actually go to a separate subfield of computer science. For example, data mining, and for example, machine learning, right? How to do machine learning inside database to actually extract insight. So it's a huge area on its own, right? So in this lecture, uh, we will scratch the surface and work through yeah, how to use some of the off the shell tools. Uh, the goal of this lecture is not teach you machine learning and not our goal, but goal is really try to introduce those kind of basic concepts about what you are able to do in today's database system and uh, to make sure when you are using a database system in the real world, when you have this application that you need to extract insight using machine learning or using data mining inside your database system, you know how to do it. Or you know how, where to find it, right? Where to learn, like, like, like start to learn about it. So the content of this lecture will not be in the exam, right? You are not going to see we query you about machine learning in the exam. The goal is really to make sure you know that there are operations you can do inside database beyond a relational query. If you look at a modern relational database system, it goes way beyond of answering relational query. So that's actually one message I really want everyone to remember after this course. That is today's database system can do way more than relational query. On the other hand, right, be aware that there are many operations you can do uh, very naturally and easily inside database that goes beyond relational query. You can do machine learning, you can do data mining, right? All those operations. That is something that you can do pretty naturally in today's database system. Also be aware that database uh, is not simply a storage and execution engine, right? But the fundamental goal of the system we are going to build together uh, is really try to get insight from data. And also when you need those functionalities in real world, you know where to find them and where to start in learning them. So 
Well, before you start, right, many of the slides actually taken from one of the Stanford courses called Many Massive Data Sets, right? So it's actually a very interesting course, right? We are taking some of the slides from, from them. So in this lecture, we are going to talk about actually three different topics. So there are three different things you can do to extract insight from your data. So first thing is actually called associated rule mining. So here's a motivating example. Assuming you are building a supermarket, Right, you have a database system storing all the transactions. For every single transaction, you know, transaction one, right, you know ah, some customer buys, uh, bought bread, coke, and milk. Right? For some other customers, they buy other things. You have millions or billions of those transactions. Each one of them contains a set of items. So if you are, you are running a supermarket, having that database, a very natural question is, OK, I really want to know what are the items that are being bought together by our customer? For example, if you know uh, milk and bread always bought together, you could put them together in your supermarket, right? To have better user experience. So this is the motivating example, right? And that is actually one type of insight that we want to get from our relational database. That is, yeah, what are the most frequent set of items that always appear together in a single basket. Here we call transaction a basket. We are going to use these two terms uh, interchangeably uh, in this lecture. And to do that, we can define the notion of support of item set I, right? So here I is a collection or set uh, of items, right? So essentially that can be simply defined by number of baskets or transactions containing all the items in the item set i. So often it's expressed as a fraction of the total number of, uh, like over the total number of, part, like, uh, of, of transactions, right? For example, like 1% of transactions contains this item set, right? Sometimes when you say spot, we, like, we mean the number of tuples. Sometimes in practice, right, we mean the fraction, right? So I'm giving a support threshold S, right? So the set of items that appear uh, in at least S transactions are often called frequent item sets. Okay, so it's a very popular concept in data mining. Right? Simply means yeah. So if a item set is frequent, it means that its support, right, is uh, larger than S, a uh, pretty fun threshold. So this is actually a very simple concept, but as you can see, as as we will see later, it's going to become very useful. So let's look at one example to make sure we are on the same page about what support really means. So assume you have this like five items, right? And then uh, I want to say, yeah, my support threshold is three transactions or three baskets. So, and I have a whole bunch of baskets or transactions, right? For uh, basket one, I have a milk, coke, and a beer, right? All together, I have eight of those transactions. So if you think about the support, right? What do we have? What is support for the item site containing a single element M? Right. In this case, where computer support is very easy, you go through every single transaction or basket, right? You see, yeah, whether the content of this item set is a subset of the transaction, right? If you look at B1, right? Yeah, it contains M. If you look at B2, it contains M, good. If you count how many baskets contains M, right? The support of this item set is five. I think we all agree on that. And then you can actually do this exercise computer support for C, for P, and also you can compute that for the item set contains actually a pair uh, of elements, for example, M and B, right? In this case, if you check the support of M and B, you can see B1 and uh, B5, B6, and B3, right? Are all the transactions containing all the elements of this item side. So the support of this equals to four, right? So you can do this exercise for all of this. And then if you say, yeah, so the support threshold is three, it means that under this threshold, these are all the frequent items, right? These are all the item sites that has support bigger than the threshold. So far, so good, right? So this is a very simple concept called the support. So, but simply having support is actually useful in some applications, but uh, in many applications, you actually want to know more about your data. Often what people know, or like want to know is not really the co-occurrence of items, 
but actually more about the association between different items. And we call those association rules. They are the if then rules about the content of the basket. For example, if we have a one association rule from I1, I2 to IK, all the way to J, right? On the left hand side, I have item side. On the right hand side, I have a single item. This rule means that if I have a basket containing all the items of I1 to IK, then it is very likely it also contains item J, right? So often these are the type of rules that you are really curious about. These are the insights you want from your data to really abstract your data and compress your data into a collection of rules. So once you have this, you can start to do decision-making using your data. You can say, yeah, now I see this customer already bought I1 to IK, right? Highly likely this person will also buy J because that was my data is telling me. And that is the motivation that why we care about this association rules. So if you look at this, right, in practice, there are so many different rules like this. And the thing that we want to do is really try to find those significant and interesting rules. And the one question, given this motivation, is really try to define what is significant and what is interesting, because there are so many different ways that you can define those. One way to define this is by defining the notion of confidence. The confidence of a given association rule is actually the probability of the right-hand side given the left-hand side. And you can actually write down this in the notation of support. It is simply the support of I and J together. So number of transactions, baskets, containing both I and J divided by the support of the, left, of the left hand side. Essentially, if you think about this, yeah, this is actually the conditional probability. If you assume a uniform distribution of your tuples, for example, this is actually the conditional probability of J given I, right? So that's something we call the confidence of this association rule. Another thing that's about interest, uh, like, uh, like uh, to define interesting, is actually caused by the, the observation that not all the high confidence rules uh, are useful or, or interesting. So think about the following case, right? So assume you have a rule, right? Uh, called left-hand side is X, some item side. The so right-hand side, uh, for example, is milk, right? So if you look at this, assuming milk is a very, very popular item, right? So assuming every single customer, when they go to supermarket, always buy milk, right? 100% of customer buy milk. So in this case, it actually doesn't matter what you put on the left-hand side the confidence of this rule will always be 100%, right? Because in this case, if every single customer always buy milk, right? The support of X together with milk is actually the same as support of X on itself, right? If you compute the confidence, right? No matter what you put on the left-hand side, you always have uh, essentially uh, confidence equals to one in this case, if everyone always buy milk 100% of the time. So as we can see, confidence intuitively tells something about this rule. It's a conditional probability, right? It tells something, but it's not really enough to give us all the insight that we want. So we need a different ways to define what is interesting, right? So another concept called interest of an association rule from I to J, is actually defined by actually the improvement of information that you have by knowing the left-hand side. Essentially, that's the difference between the confidence of this rule and also the fraction of basket that containing the right-hand side. So precisely, it's actually defined like this. You have the confidence, which is the probability of J condition on I, right, minus actually the probability of J, that's the fraction, right? So this simply means that once I know I, how much difference it's going to make on the, my probability of the right-hand side, right? In this case, if you say, yeah, I have the milk, it's a very popular item, uh, no matter uh, what happened, every single customer always buy milk, right? So in this case, the probability of J of milk 
will equals one, right? Because yeah, so all the transactions have milk. On the left hand side, the confidence will also be one. So the interest of this rule, right, will be zero, right? Simply means that it doesn't matter whether I know this customer bought X or not, right? It doesn't matter whether I know it or not, my confidence on whether this customer will buy milk will not change. So this rule is not interesting to me. So interesting rules, right, are often those rules with high positive or high or, 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 or really negative interest values, right? Usually above something like 0 0.5 as a rule of thumb. So as you can see, given association rule, right? So there are multiple concepts. There is the support, right? Which is pretty much the frequency, right? And there is the confidence, which corresponds to the conditional probability, right? Of the right-hand side given the left-hand side. And then there's the interest, the amount of additional information it can get condition on the left-hand side. So all of these three fundamental quantities actually describe how interesting an association rule is. So let's look at one example to make sure we are on the same page about all these three important concepts about the rule. So assuming we have this database with eight different transactions, and then given an association rule like MB to C, okay? What is the confidence? And to compute the confidence, it's very easy, right? You say, yeah, so let us let me put M, B, and C together as a one item site and compute the support, right? In this case, the support of M, B, and C will equals to two, right? Because only transaction B1 and B6 containing this whole item set. And then if you look at the, 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 the and, and you divide two by the support of M and B, right? In this case, uh, the support of M and B will equals to four, right? B1, B3, B5, B6 all have this pair. So the confidence of this rule is actually 0 0.5, which pretty much means, right, in probability, if I know this customer, uh, this customer bought M and B with probability 0 0.5, right? This customer will also buy C. So that's what the confidence try to capture, assuming your tuple is simple from a distribution in IID fashion. So that's the, that's the assumption. If you look at the interest, right, how to compute that? Yeah, so you take the confidence, 0 0.5, and you divide it by essentially the probability of the right-hand side, the C, right? By knowing nothing, what is the probability that C is going to happen? In this case, right, you have the support of C equals to five, Right, because B1, B4, B6, B7, B8 contain C. You divide that by total number of transactions you have, you get five over eight. If you compute the difference, right, the interest is one over eight in this case. So in many cases, right, so this rule might not be a very interesting one because even though the confidence is actually pretty high, right, predicting customer behavior with probably 0 0.5 is fascinating, right? However, right, so the interest is actually not that high, right? Because you are actually, the left-hand side actually doesn't matter too much in boosting or decreasing the confidence of rule. So now we know how to do these three things. What is the problem, right? So the problem is that if I give you a database with millions or billions or trillions of transactions, so computing all the association rules with a big support and a big confidence, it's actually very expensive because there are so many different association rules that you could have. And I cannot, for each of them, go through the same uh, exercise that we have been doing in the previous slides. Because there are exponential many association rules, I cannot compute the support and confidence for each one of them and check. So I need to do some better algorithm to really make sure we can find all those association rules with a big support and also with a big confidence. So the hard part, right? So to really understand this problem is really try to find all the frequent item sites. Try to find all the item sites with a support higher than some threshold. So if you think about why, right? If, you, if I have a rule, I1, IK, right, point to J. Assuming this rule is interesting in the sense that it has a high support 
and high confidence, right? So, and then it actually means two things. It actually means the left-hand side uh, need to be frequent. And also the whole thing, I1 to IK plus J, right? The whole thing, right? Also uh, need to be frequent, right? If you think about why, it's actually, if the left-hand side is not frequent, right? Then the support of this rule will not be high, okay? If the right hand, if the whole thing is not frequent, right? Then the confidence of this rule will also not be high. So that's actually how support of confidence right, of a rule all connected to whether the left hand side of the whole rule is actually frequent or not. So the fundamental computational problem that we are going to solve and look at in this lecture, actually what the researchers have been working on for like 20 or 30 years, is actually given trillions of transactions. How can you find all the frequent item sets? Well, given that frequent item set, you can generate all the association rules with a big support and a big confidence. So this is usually how associates rule manual works, okay? <clears throat> And that's also to make it more precise about how to connect support to an interesting association rule. <clears throat> so what happens is people often just find all the frequent item sets, all the frequent item sets. And then we, we are going to look at how to do that. Yeah, just assume you're able to do it. Given a database, you know, ah, this is all the frequent item sets. And the second step is actually you go through every single frequent item set I, and for every single subset of I, you generate an association rule, mapping from A, which is a subset, to all the other attributes. And then, since you know I is frequent, you know A is also frequent because it's a subset, right? So the support of A must be larger than the support of I because A is a subset of I. Since I is frequent, you know A is also frequent. So, and then the thing that you are going to do is by checking the confidence of this rule because you already know, right? So it's a, it's a, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's something that have strong support. So there are different things you can do. One thing you can do to compute the confidence uh, is you can just, uh, uh, actually go back to definition to say, yeah, let me compute the, 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 the support of the whole thing, divided by support of the left-hand side, then I have the confidence. You check whether the confidence is larger than some constant or not. If it's larger, you output it. Otherwise, you move on, right? So this is one way to do it, right? Another way uh, to do it is actually based on the following operation. That is, if you have, for example, an association rule, A, B, C to D, is below the confidence. It's actually not confident at all. That can imply the rule A, B to C, D will also uh, be below the confidence. Right? If you think about why, right? if you think about the confidence of A, B to C, D, right? so like essentially it is the support of A, B, C, D divided by the support of A, B, Right, support of AB uh, is actually always larger than the support of ABC, right? So essentially, uh, the confidence of AB to CD is always going to be smaller than the confidence of ABC to D. If you know ABC to D is below confidence, so that's AB to CD, right? So given this observation, you can actually generate actually bigger rules, right, from smaller ones, right? You can take a very small rule. Right, um, that is confident, and you keep generating it. Right, so that's actually something that you are able to do. And then, given this, right, you output all the rules that are above the confidence threshold. So, if you look at this algorithm of many association rules, right, so you can see the fundamental step is actually how to find all the frequent item sets, and that is something that we are going to talk more. So this is actually one example, right? So we will now look at it. Uh, when you go back home, it's very easy to see uh, why this is the case. 
following the algorithm uh, from the previous slides. Now let's spend more time and try to understand actually how to find those frequent item sites. So what's interesting is by observing the following structure of the problem. That is different item sites. First one, right? So how many item sites do you have? Given D different items, right? There are two to the D possible item sites, right? So you, you only have those two to the D number of item sites. So what's interesting is that if you look at uh, the lattice governing all those two to the D possible item sites, you have two observations. The first one is that uh, if you have uh, essentially one item site right in the middle that is actually have a large enough support in the sense that uh, it is frequent. It means that all the node above it, which is a subset, should also be uh, frequent. And if you know a thing in the middle that is not frequent, then everything below it, which is the super side, will also not be frequent. And that is the fundamental structure that we are going to play with. So while given this, right, without using any structure, there is always a naive algorithm right, that we are trying to beat or trying to improve over. You can always brute force, so nothing stops you from doing that. So what we are going to do is to enumerate all the possible candidates in the lattice, and you count the support by scanning the data. I mean, this is a very naive algorithm, that, but it's going to be correct. So if you look at this algorithm, right? So what is the time complexity? Well, time comes to going to equals to, yeah, number of transactions, right? Multiply uh, actually by how many items, right? The maximum number of items you have for each transaction, right? That's the size uh, of your database, right? And then for each candidate, right? You scan the data set, the uh, scan database to compute the frequency. Uh, yeah, so compute the support. Right, com com time complexity equals to number of transactions multiplied by W, number of items per transaction multiplied by how many candidates that you have. Right, the space complexity, yeah, equals to the list of all the candidates. It is expensive because the amount of candidates you have is actually exponential uh, with respect to the number of elements that you have. Right. In practice, you think about Netflix, right? have hundreds of thousands of movies, right? So the amount of item sites, candidates that you have, yeah, could be huge, two to a couple million, right? So, and that is a fundamental problem of this. So what's actually interesting is people start to improve it uh, over the years, for 20 or 30 years. There's one very famous algorithm called a priori, Right. I think 10 years ago, this was the highest cited paper in computer science at some point. It's based on a very interesting principle. That is, if an item set is frequent, right, then all of its subset must also be frequent because you are counting the support. If an item set is not frequent, then all of its super site cannot be frequent at all. It's actually based on this very simple property of frequent item site and try to prune the space. So essentially, it's very easy, right? So if you know in the lattice, if you know, for example, CDE, right, this item site is frequent, right? Then everything above it will also be frequent. If you know, for example, AB, right, this item site is not frequent, then everything below it, right, will also not be frequent. And then you shouldn't, you, you, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you could, but you don't have to look at all the super site of an infrequent item site at all. So this is the fundamental principle of the a, a priori algorithm. And the whole thing is actually quite simple, right? You maintain actually two different data structure. You maintain CK, right? Which is all the candidate item sites of size K. And you also maintain LK, which is the actual frequent item set that you produce of size K. 
And what do you do, right? So in the beginning, you k equals to one. You consider all the item set with one element. And then all the candidate are essentially all the items. Okay, for every single item, that's one candidate. And then what you do, right, is you start to say, yeah, for each of the CK, the candidate, I check uh, the frequency and put them into the actual frequent item set if they are frequent. You put the, those re real frequent items to LK. And then you try to generate a bigger candidate. You generate a CK plus one, right? All the item sites with size K plus one using LK, right? So, and then you continue to do this once you are done. So this is at the high level what the A a priori is actually trying to do. So if you look at this example, right? Look at this database. In the very beginning, right? Every single item will be a candidate, right? In this case, you have six items, so you have six candidates. And then what you are going to do is for every single of those candidates, right? You will do a screenshot scan of your database and try to compute the frequency, right? In this case, bright appear four times, coke appear twice, right? You have all of this. And then you can already see if you suppose threshold three, right? So there are two items that are not going to be uh, frequent. Coke itself is not frequent because only appear twice. X itself is also not frequent because only appear once. And then what you are going to do is going to take this and generate a bigger candidate item set, right? In this case, what's interesting is you will not generate the candidate involving cake and egg, right? Because cake and egg on their own is not frequent. Their superset cannot be frequent, right? So in this case, the amount of candidate you have in the two item side case, right? It's not six choose two, right? It's not 30, right? In this case, you are only considering all those cases, right? Without Coke and without egg. So you get this six different candidates. And then for each one of them, you are gonna compute, yeah, how frequent that they appear, right? In this case, you say, yeah, the, 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 the two item side, bread and beer is not frequent, milk and beer is not frequent, you get rid of those. And then you start to generate all the triples, all the three item sets. Okay? So in this case, there's actually only uh, one candidate, right? Because you need to find, uh, you, yeah, you need to find those item sites that every single pair within these three item sites need to be frequent. Right. So in this case, if you look at uh, these four pairs, right? The only triple you can construct is this one: bread, milk, and diaper. Right. Mm -hmm. And you say, yeah, let me count. Uh, yeah, essentially, uh, how many times that's going to appear. Right. So in this case, your count equals to two, so it's not frequent at all. Right. So and then you do not need to worry about all the four item set anymore. Right. Because you do not have a frequent triple, there's no way you can construct a quadruple out of it that's frequent. So as you can see, once you do this pruning step, right? If you say, yeah, without doing pruning in the naive strategy, right? So if you are, you're, you're curious about all the triplets, right? So how many uh, kind of subsets you need to consider, right? You need to do six choose one, right? That's the beginning, six choose two, right? That's in the middle. Six to three, that's actually the, the, the triplets. That's all the possible combinations you have. But if you do this support based pruning, right? In the first phase, you do six choose one because that's all the one item set candidates. In the second thing, right, you do not do six choose two anymore. You do four choose two, right? Because you already know there are actually two different uh, items cannot be there at all, right? You do four choose two. And then uh, when you do uh, the, uh, the, 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 the triplets, right, you actually have only one candidate left. So even in this very simple example with only six candidates, right, uh, sorry, six items, uh, you are talking about actually three time improvement about how much computation that you can actually save in. 
think about you have the case your number of items equal to millions or trillions right so like in this case your saving could be really significant based on a very simple idea but this pruning idea right, goes really a long way so there are something that we need to uh, kind of go a little bit deeper to actually have the a priori algorithm. So one thing that you can do, right? So is that uh, once I find all those really frequent candidates, put CK, the candidate, to the LK, the real frequent item set. So how to use LK to generate uh, a collection of candidates of a slightly larger size? So we haven't talked about this step yet, right? Intuitively, we cannot know what to do, right? We need to find, so what is a candidate of size K plus one? A candidate of size K plus one are those item sets that every single K sized subset is frequent. That is actually what we, we, want, we want to achieve. So how to do that? So the principle behind it is to construct a candidate size of K plus one by, combine, by combining frequent item size of, of K. If K equals to one, right? Then you can take all the pairs of frequent, item, uh, the frequent items to produce those pairs. And then if K plus one, the thing that you are going to do, which is going to be interesting is you join those pairs of item size that differ by just one item. And for each generated item set, you want to make sure uh, that all the subsets are actually frequent. So now let's look at this kind of uh, in a little bit more detail. So here, assuming the items in the item site are actually ordered, okay? If your items are encoded by integer, you just can order them by increasing order. If they are string, you can order them in whatever order that you define. Let's assume all the items can be ordered because that's going to make our computation much easier. So to, to, the reason that we want to uh, order it is actually to ensure that if you have an item I, like Y plus X, there's two different items, but Y is ordered later than X. If you have Y appear before X, okay, then X is not in the item set, right? So that's why like we want to order them. So in this case, right, uh, you can actually have your LK, right, all the frequent items, for example, like all the frequent triples, right, order in this way. You all have item one, item two, item three, and you put them by order. The first one have one, two, three, right? For the second one, have one, two, five, one, four, five, something like this. So you actually order them this way. And then that's, if you have this, this data structure, it actually makes it much easier for to generate uh, kind of uh, item size, uh, like, like, like frequent candidate item size with four items. The thing you are going to do is going to do a self join right? You say, yeah, like I, I, I take all the pairs of tuples that sharing the first K minus one element, in this case, K equals to three. So you, you, you join those, share the same two elements, like here, one, two, and you take their third elements and you produce a new candidate. Here's a one, two, three, five, given these two tuples. So that's all you need to do. So what about this one, right? So like if I take these two tuples that doesn't share uh, the first two uh, attributes, right? So here one is one, two, four, uh, five, another is one, four, five. Right. So in this case, it's actually not the right candidate because you know this item set cannot be frequent. Right. So in this case, it's very easy to see because one to four is not in the frequent, uh, it's not in LK. So one to four is not frequent. Right. The reason behind it is in this database, you do not have one to four because if you have one to four, you can generate this tuple because then you have this pair of tuple, one to five, one to four, sharing the first two attributes. So only reason you cannot generate this tuple by drawing two uh, tuples sharing the two, same two attributes is one of these are actually not frequent. So that is why you only need to consider those pairs sharing the same 
uh, K minus one items if you order them in, in this way. So once you do this, you can actually have a very simple algorithm to actually implement a priori in SQL queries to generate this, right? So the thing that you are going to do, right, is once you have LK, right, so the frequent item of size K, how to generate candidates, right? You can actually do a self-join. You can join LK with LK, right? And you match all the first K minus one item. And then you take the last item and uh, output them, right? Once you run this SQL query, you are able to generate a bigger candidate size. So if you look at this example, right? So once I have this frequent item of set three, right? The thing that you're going to do, you can actually do a self-join, right? So first tuple is going to generate A, B, C, D, right? As a candidate, the third and the fourth tuple is going to generate A, C, D, E, right? As a candidate. And then there are no other candidates. All the other combinations of these four different items will not be frequent, and you know that. So that's the beauty of this. In practice, right, when you want to do a social Romanian, so there are a lot of things that you can use uh, inside, your, inside your database. So one tool, if you're using PostgreSQL, a very popular tool is called Apache Medlib, right? So when you do this in real world, right, try to Google Medlib and you are going to fund it and you are going to look at all the methods it's kind of producing, right? But the high level idea of this is that once I have, for example, uh, a database called test data, for example, right? In this case, you can see, yeah, so my data is organized in the following way. Two attributes. The first attribute is transaction ID. The second attribute is the product, for example. And you can actually say, yeah, let's put a whole bunch of information here, right? The first transaction has beer, first transaction has diaper, for example, have a whole bunch of those pairs between transaction ID and product. Once you have this, there's a single function call you can actually call inside database, right? Uh, for to actually generate uh, association rules. Right? In this case, say, yeah. So the support of the rule I want should be larger than 0 0.25. This is the confidence, right? So this is my transaction ID column, right? So this is my product, right? This is where to get the data, right? So once you have this, it's going to generate a new relation, right? In this case, it's called association rules. And then if you query this association rule table, it's going to give you something that look like this. Right. If you look at this, it's going to give you every single row uh, is a row, okay? And then the second column is the left-hand side. The third column is the right-hand side, right? This rule means there's association rule from diaper to beer. So this is uh, actually the support of it, right? So this is the confidence of this rule. So there are other properties, for example, lift, conviction of, of, like, of a rule, right? So, so, so that, that, that different dimension of why this rule is interesting, right? So you have all those transactions, right? So, and then that's actually something that you can already do uh, inside your database. If you do PostgreSQL, right? You can just install MyLib in, I think it's very easy. It's like, uh, like, uh, like, like two or three uh, commands, right? Then you can actually run this uh, all by yourself. So again, this is not everything about, about association rule, but one thing just to really remember, right? Is if you have a database, you want to understand those association. And sometimes it's not about causality, but about conditional probability, right? About all those associations. So the, so the, the, the term to Google uh, is association rule mining, okay? And the core of it, what database people have been doing in the last actually like two or three decades is how to make that process as efficient as possible. And the fundamental goal of those algorithm design is really try to prune those space as much as possible to eliminate those item size that you know is not going to be frequent at all and do not consider those. So that's a high level idea. So this is the first functionality that we talk about today. Uh, now let's take a break. When we get back, we are going to look at the clustering and classification or something that you can do actually inside your database. So if you have any questions, I'll be here to answer them. Otherwise, yeah, let's take a 15 minutes break.
Okay, so let's continue to talk about other things you can do inside the database. So apart from associated room mining, try to find associations from your data inside your database, you can also do clustering, right? So as the name implied, right? So this is actually uh, the operation that you try to group objects together, such as uh, inside each group, you contains all those similar uh, items. Uh, or another way to define it is to make sure uh, the item from one group is actually different from uh, other groups. So here, when we are talking about objects, right? So the thing that we are thinking about is every single tuple inside your database, which actually corresponding to different entities, right? So if you model it using entity relationship model, we think about each one of them as an object. We try to group them together. So this is just a, a simple way a view of this, right? If you have in this three dependent space, right? You have this multiple of these points, each of data point corresponding to, for example, one tuple inside your database instance, right? You could form this actually three different clusters, right? Such that, for example, maybe the intro cluster distance are minimized, maybe the intro cluster distance are maximized, or maybe both, or maybe a combination of these two. So the thing about interesting about the clustering, which is why people have been working on this for a really long time, is the notion of a cluster can be ambiguous. So by just looking at this picture, right? So we have this whole bunch of data points embedded in this actually two-dimensional space. How many clusters do we have, right? So yeah, I mean, the reason why people could disagree on the answer of this question, you could have, yeah, depending on what, what you think clusters really are, you could think, yeah, there could be two clusters, right? So there's a cluster from on the left-hand side, a cluster on the right-hand side, right? So there could also be, for example, six clusters, right? Some of them, yeah. So, so for each of the bigger, like, like a big cluster, you, you can have smaller clusters, right? So I have different arrangement, right? If you have some prayer about the shape of the cluster, right? People could well say, yeah, there are four clusters. If they know the meaning of the data, right? Could look like this. So if you take this thing, right? So there are so many different ways that you can actually cluster your data together into different groups. So the way that we think about it, right? Inside database as the provider of a functionality of a clustering, the abstraction is the same. So the, 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 you, you can define cluster in different ways, but abstraction, the interface we provide to our user are the same. You have this relation, right? Each row co co corresponding to different entities, right? So, and then you can actually embed every single row into a point in some space, right? And then you can cluster in those points together, and then you are forming different groups. Right uh, of this relation, so that is how we how we actually think about it. So, a clustering, right? It's a set of clusters. So it's an important distinction um, when we talk about clustering uh, is that there are actually two different ways that we can think about grouping, right? One is actually hierarchical, another is partitional. So when you talk about partitional clustering, right, we are actually divide the data objects into different subsets. And each subset uh, is actually disjoint with each other. That is, you cannot find a single data object or single tuple or single entity, whatever you want to call it, in two different clusters, right? Every single data object is in exactly one such subset. When we talk about those partitional clustering, this is actually what we mean. And of course, there's the hierarchical one. Right, so you can actually have a set of nice state clusters organized as a hierarchical tree. Right, for example, all the dogs right, belongs to one cluster called dog, uh, and dog and cat belongs to another cluster called animal. Right, so there is this hierarchical structure. You actually start to nice them together. Right, so this could be another way to actually think about the clustering. But just taking all those kind of like uh, like uh, like, uh, like take all the two dimensional points. Right. So for example, if you do partitional clustering, right, the thing you could have is, yeah, I divide all those points into different clusters that uh, they do not uh, actually overlap with each other. If you do this hierarchical thing, 
right? So actually different notion of hierarchical clustering, right? If you do the traditional one, right? So once you can have is, yeah, so P2 and P3 belongs to one cluster, right? And that P2, P3 cluster also cluster together with P4 from a bigger cluster, then have P1, something like this, right? You could have those like a non-traditional one say, so yeah, P1 and P2 are one cluster, P3 and P4 another cluster, then, then together form another bigger cluster. So the only thing, right, so that doesn't change here is actually you have this nice state structure. You have a bigger cluster and a smaller cluster, right, nested together. This is what we call hierarchical cluster. So, and then there are actually different type of clusters, right? So there's actually some type of clusters that uh, the, uh, the criteria that you use to cluster points together Right, is to say, yeah, so what is a cluster, right? And one potential definition is a cluster is a set of points such that any point in a cluster is closer or similar, right? You compute their, their distance to every other point in the cluster uh, than any uh, other point not in the cluster, right? So essentially in this definition, uh, your actually clusters are actually separated. They're actually far away. Right, so there's actually no points like uh, like in the middle, right? So and then if you have this, right? So you have this well separated clusters. If your data align like this, but you could define the criteria of clustering, for example, based on center, right? You can say, yeah. So I don't like the well separated uh, notion of clustering, right? I could say a cluster in my definition, right? Is a set of objects such that an object in the cluster is closer. And that's the center of that cluster is closer, right, to an object, right, compared uh, with other centers. Okay, so like if you like take this view, right, you are actually putting those like different points into kind of like a ball, right, and and you are assigning your your data example to each of those centers. Okay, so the center of a cluster is always a centroid, right? like often a centroid. Right, so the like which is a minimizer of distance from all the points in the cluster, right? Uh, or maybe some representative points of a cluster, right? So and there are different things you can do, but you could define uh, this notion by using center, right? And you could do other things, right? You could say, yeah, so my notion of clustering is cluster a set of points such that the point in the cluster is closer to one or more other points in the cluster than any other point not in the cluster. Right here, you have this trinitive notion of clustering. Right, you start to have groups things that are kind of connected, right, together. Uh, you could have those like density based view. Right, you say what is a clustering uh, strategy? A cluster is the dense region of points, right, that's separated by low density region from other region of high density. Right, so in this case, like you could would have clustering uh, strategy that look like this, as long as you have two high density regions separated by low density region, right? So that's, that's something you have. So you could even have more abstract notion of clustering and say, yeah, so uh, uh, what's this cluster, right? So you can define some shared common property, for example, they're all circles, right? So then you can say, yeah, they should come together. So there are so many different ways you can define a cluster, right? So essentially when you deal with the real data, the rule of thumb is really try to think about the property of the data and, 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 and why you want to cluster in them, right? And what the property you are trying to capture. And then it hopefully uh, become rather natural about uh, which notion of clustering that you are talking about. And given that, you can actually run different clustering algorithm to actually reflect your notion of clustering. So we are not going to go through all the possible ways to cluster data. We are going to talk about a very simple way, right? Called the k-means algorithm. It's a partitional clustering approach. Uh, essentially, each cluster is associated uh, with a centroid. It's a center point. Okay, so it's a center-based notion, and each point is assigned to a cluster with the closed centroid, uh, the input to the algorithm, uh, you need to define the number of clusters, k, uh, which is not often the case for other algorithms, right? But for this algorithm, uh, you need to define the number of clusters, which is a constant. And then the objective, right, of solving, uh, like the problem you are trying to solve 
is really try to minimize the sum of distance of the point to their respective uh, centroid. Okay, so to do this algorithm, you need to embed all those data objects into a some space, and then you can measure the distance between those uh, points, right? So one common definition is do the Euclidean distance, right? So, and then you can actually try to minimize the sum of square error function. Uh, so sometimes when people talk about k-means, this is what we uh, what they think about, but you can make that a little bit more generic to actually uh, reason about different type uh, of distance function. So problem is actually like this, right? So I have a set x of n points, right? Each point uh, is an n-dimensional vector. Uh, and then I have k, which is the number of clusters that I want to produce. And then uh, my cluster is C1, C2, Ck, right? Each one of them contains a whole bunch of points. So the thing that you are actually trying to minimize is really try to find C1 to Ck, right? Such that uh, the average distance of each point to their to, to the center of their assigned cluster uh, is minimized. Here, CI is the mean of points uh, in the cluster CI. So this is actually a fundamental problem that we are trying to solve in the k-means algorithm. So it is very hard. It looks very simple, but it's very hard. So the NP hard if the dimensionality of the data is at least two. So when you have um, a low dimension data, like one dimension data, actually your every single example corresponds to a single value, right? So it is in P, okay? So, but for real data is often uh, higher dimensional, right? So it's actually very hard to have the exact algorithm for k-means, even though it looks very simple. So what's happened in practice is that a very simple iterative algorithm actually work quite well. So it's, it's, it's work like this. So it's actually very simple. So essentially uh, you first like K points uh, as the initial centroid, and then you repeat the following process. That is given those initial centroid, you assign all the points to the closest centroid, and then you form a cluster. And then given that clustering strategy, you recompute your centroid and then you and then you reassign your data example to those new centroid and you continue this process again again and again until the centroids do not change so this is a very simple algorithm and people talk about k means often people are thinking about this algorithm not the generic objective that is actually try to approximate so if you look at this, right, so actually very simple to see, right? So assuming I have this two dimensional space, have a whole bunch of these data examples, each point corresponding to one tuple in your database. In the beginning, I just pick three random points, okay? So we have these three different centers, and then I assign all the data example to the closest centroid, right? In this case, I have these three different clusters, one in the, in the, in the, in the, in the top, right? Another two in the bottom, right? And then I have, and, and then what I'm going to do is I recompute the centroid. For example, if you take all the green point, right? Their centroid will be here, right? Not uh, the original place. You recompute the centroid and then you reassign your example to the new centroid, right? So, and then you continue, continue, continue until your clustering strategy, that, that is the centroid, doesn't change at all. So in this case, once you run that for six iterations, right, you can see you start to stabilize, right? Your iteration five and iteration six essentially have the same clustering strategy, then you stop. So one thing that's interesting about this, if you look at this, it's actually not deterministic in the sense that the result of this algorithm heavily depends on how you pick your centroid in the beginning. So remember this strategy, okay? Remember iteration six, you have one big cluster on the top and they have two smaller uh, cluster in the bottom. If I pick a different centroid in the beginning, so you could have a very different clustering strategy, 
right? In this case, if you run this again, again, and again, right? What you are going to have is actually something like this. You have one cluster on the top, one in the middle, another in the bottom. It's very different from the thing that you saw in the previous slides, even though it is the same data set. And if you look at this cluster, it actually makes sense. Both actually make sense. So that's one thing you need to be really careful when you're actually running this clustering algorithm inside your database. That is often the case, um, they are not as deterministic as you thought. Okay. So how to deal with this random initialization, right? People have been working on a whole bunch of things. Right? You could do multiple runs, right? And uh, select the clustering with the smallest error. Right, because remember, K means right. You 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 have one true objective that you want to solve. Right, each one of these initialization is a pr approximation of that. You could run multiple runs and pick one with the smallest objective error. Right, so you could uh, uh, try to select the original points uh, by not using random. Right, for example, you can pick the most distant points uh, as the cluster uh, as the cluster centers. Uh, so on and so forth. So another thing that's uh, to keep in mind, right? So here, when we talk about centroid, right? Sometimes we think about, yeah, we take the average of all the points, right? So that step could be hard, okay? That actually depends on the distance function, right? Because you are actually trying to find a point that minimize the distance, that's the centroid, right? For Euclidean distance, that happens to be the average, that point happened to be the case, uh, happened to be the point that minimized all distances, right? But it doesn't have to be the case, right? So if you have other type of distance, uh, finding the centroid might not always be easy, right? It actually could be an NP hard problem on its own for actually some distance function to just find the centroid given a collection of points. So, but anyway, right? K means we will actually converge for common similarity measures uh, that we mentioned above. If you are doing Euclidean distance, uh, it will converge. If you do some other little bit weird distance, uh, it's not guaranteed that K-mean will always converge, right? But for most of those common similarity measures, K-mean will actually converge. Uh, what's interesting about K-means it's actually converged relatively fast, right? Most of the conversion happens uh, in the first few iterations. So, and often the stopping condition for, for, the, for the algorithm uh, is, is not really to say, yeah, uh, until the century is stabilized, but until relatively few points change clusters, because that's probably going to uh, finish earlier. Uh, the complexity of this algorithm uh, look like this, right? Well, n is number of points, k is number of clusters, i is number of iterations, d is the dimensionality, right? So essentially, uh, like this measures for every single iteration, right? So you need to scan your data, right? Assign them to clusters, right? And like this. You compute the distance, which is a function of the dimensionality. So in general, it's a very fast and efficient algorithm. So what's the problem of k-means as an algorithm, right? So the, the, the potential problem of this uh, is that when your cluster are of different size, different density, it doesn't look like a ball, right? So it, it, it could give you something a little bit weird, okay? Because um, k-means have the tendency to form a little bit more homogeneous cluster in shape, size, and density, and right? So, and also when your data have outliers, right? You have one data example, which is really far away from everyone else, right? So that could also cause problems, right? For example, you could have this, for example, this data example generated by three different populations, right? Uh, you have the blue one, the red one, the green one, right? If you run those k-means to have three clusters, highly likely it will not have this big one in the middle. So highly likely it will actually try to uh, have a case like this. You have this relatively homogeneous cluster in terms of size, right? So which is actually can have a tendency to actually enforce. So uh, if you have something like this, highly likely if you run k-means, it will not give you uh, that this very big 
uh, cluster on left hand side and the two smaller one on the right hand side, highly likely what you're going to have is this little bit more homogeneous partition of the space. If you have this thing, right, you have this like uh, two moon, right, something like this, right, highly likely k min will not give you this, highly likely if you run k means if you actually cut actually in the middle, right. So what should you do, right? So in practice, uh, what people often do is actually to increase the number of clusters that you have, right? Instead of having three clusters, you can have a whole bunch of clusters, right? So for example, in this case, you could have these 10 different clusters, and then you look at the result, and then you try to merge them by yourself, like or by some other automatic algorithm to actually help you to actually put them together. In this case, if you have many clusters, you can see on the left-hand side, the big one is being partitioned into a whole bunch of smaller ones, right? While there are two separate clusters on the, on the right-hand side, right? And then what you can do is to say, yeah, so now let me group all those like things on the left-hand side into a bigger cluster, right? So that's something that people often do in practice. So this is happen if you have this double moon type of shape, right? If you have many clusters, you have something like this. You can look at the centroid, right? Then you can actually start to merge them into whatever thing that actually makes sense. So in practice, right, what can you do? Right, so in practice, if you go to Matlab, right, the thing that you can do uh, is the following, right? So essentially you can actually create a table contains a whole bunch of samples, right? So here, Right, uh, every single row corresponding to essentially uh, one data example, right? So the first attribute is the ID of this data example, and then followed by a whole bunch of uh, features, right? For each dimension, here's a value. Essentially, every single tuple in your database become one point in this high dimensional space. And then if you say, yeah, so given this database, I want to cluster all those together using the k-means algorithm, right? So then what you can do is so you say, yeah, so there's a mylib.k-means, right? So clustering uh, function, right? You can just call it. The input is what? Is the, the where, where is your data, right? So this is the, 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 the table of the source data, right? And then you followed by the column, the attributes contains all those parts. Right, so just give the name of the column into the database. Uh, you give the the system the k, right? So here, say yeah, I want to do the two cluster, right? Then uh, you give it the distance function. You give it the aggregation function about how to find the centroid, right? In this case, you are saying yeah, let me find the centroid using the average function because I'm using essentially the Euclidean distance. You specify how many iterations that you want to run. So here's 20, right? And then you specify the uh, terminating condition, right? Here, which is a fraction of centroid realization to keep iterating, right? So once you have this, uh, you can actually run this function, right? So this is simply a user defined function, right? Once you have this, it's actually going to uh, give you something like this. This is actually the output. So as you can see, that what's going to have uh, is that it's going to output two different centroid. So these are the two clusters because that's what you specify. This is the coordinate of the first centroid. And then this is the coordinate of the second centroid, right? So, and then you have some other statistics, for example, the cluster variance, right? Something, something like this. So once you have this, right, you can actually uh, also start to say that, so, so there's actually another function, try to re, try to assign, right? So each of the centroid uh, to each of the parts, right? So here it's actually uh, looks something like this. Here's just another function called closest column, right? Which actually assign centroid with this point, right? So once you run this of your original data and your centroid you get from the k-means algorithm, you will have something that look like this, right? So here, the first attribute is the ID. The second attribute is all the points, right? And the third attribute is the cluster ID, right? Which cluster that I assign this example to? 
And then the, the last attribute is the distance, right? How far away this point is to that centroid of the cluster, right? So as you can see, this is a very simple algorithm, but also something that very natural field to do inside your database, right? Okay, so, but you can do more inside your database system. So another thing that we are going to talk about, about those analytic features you can do inside your database, uh, is called classification. Okay, so the high level idea behind the classification uh, looks like this. So assuming I have a data site, right? Uh, for example, here, I think uh, in this example uh, is the people fed in tax, right? Whether they are cheating in their tax return or not, okay? So I have a whole bunch of history, for example, for previous years, right? So, and now uh, I'm doing another round of tax return for a new year. How can I make a prediction, right? Given a person, right? Which I don't know whether that person is cheating or not. How can we, given the history, right? This relation, right? Try to predict, right? Whether this new example, like, like, like this new person uh, is actually cheating or not, right? So if you talk about this classification problem, right? We actually try to learn a model for actually discriminating between records of different classes. Okay, here we are trying to discriminate uh, records between cheating and not cheating, right? We want to separate them using all the other attributes. So this is actually something that we want to do. As you can see in this case, right? It, 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 it fits into the relational schema really well, right? All the historical record is a relation, right? And all the things you want to predict is also another relation. You are trying to fill in the blank, right? So that is actually intuitively what it tries to do. So classification is a task of learning a target function that actually map a set of attributes X to one of the predefined class label Y, right? So in this case, you actually try to learn a function, right? That map refund, marital status, taxable income into a predefined class label called cheat, right? So that's actually fundamentally what a classification model try to do. So there are a lot of applications about classification. If you think about machine learning, this is one of the cornerstone of modern machine learning, right, which is a classification task. How to predict whether tumor is benign or not, right? How to classify uh, credit card transactions, uh, fraud or not, right? So, and how to categorize news article into different category, right? And how to identify spam after email, spam web pages, right? how to understand if a web queries have commercial intent or not, right? So all of those applications you are actually using every single day in your daily life, under the cover is a classification problem. So usually how classification problem works is that you have a training site, right? Contains all those examples with a known class label. On the other hand, you use this training site to build a classification model and then giving a test set, right? So it, it contains uh, unseen data record, right? So, and uh, that is why you do not know the class, you do not know the prediction. You try to apply this model to make prediction given all the other attributes. So you have this training set and you have, you have this test set. So given a classification model, right? So there are so many different ways you can evaluate whether it is a good model uh, or not. Right. So, but the one not common way, but one one simple way, but one of the most popular, one popular way, uh, is to actually think about this confusion matrix. Right. So, on one hand, you have this essentially actual class of your example. Right. On the other hand, you have this predicted class. Right. Everything in the diagonal. Right. So that's actually how many examples that I make a correct prediction. I predict to be one, the actual class is also one, right? How many examples that fall into that, right? We count the number and call the F11, so on and so forth. Everything that, 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 that like F10 and F01 are actually all the mistakes, right? So this model is making uh, on the test side. So given this, you can compute the accuracy, the error rate, right? And so many different, uh, uh, quantities to actually measure how good a classifier, right, a classification model really is. 
So today we are not going to go deep into uh, state-of-the-art classification method. We are going to look at a very simple case. Okay. So that's something called instance-based learning, which is very powerful. So the idea is very simple. Okay. So once you store all those training records, right? So we can actually use those training record, uh, training record without training model to predict the class level of unseen case. So the high level idea is that if you have a whole bunch of animals and you have another test record, right? So what you can do, you can just probably try to find the most similar examples by computing the distance, right? You pick the top K nearest record giving some distance matrix. And then you take the label and you aggregate them. So it's a very simple intuition, but extremely powerful uh, to give you something called a Kenyan's neighbor classifier. So it's actually very simple. Okay? It, it requires three things. You need a set of stored record at the training site. Uh, you need, and, and e each record corresponds to one point in the space. You need a distance metric to actually compute the distances between records. You need to know how far away they are. Maybe you clean in distance, but you can do other type of distance. And then you uh, need the value of K, right? the number of nearest neighbor to retrieve. And now if you have this one data example, which is this right uh, circle, right? So what you're going to have is you are going to compute the distance of this red circle, the test example, to all the other training record. And then you identify the K nearest neighbor and you take the class label of the Kenyan snare because they are training examples, right? You know their label. And then you try to determine the class label of this unknown record. Maybe you can take a majority vote, right? In this case, all the three nearest neighbor, right, are positive class, right? You can say, yeah, if they vote, I'm going to have a positive class. I'm going to assign that to this unknown test example. So the one thing that's tricky, right, is how to compute the distance between two points there's a, so many things you can do, right? You can compute Euclidean distance, something look like this, but you can do a whole bunch of other type of distance. I mean, you, in some cases, you can even learn what type of distance that you want to use. So, and the second step you need to do is, is to determine the class, right? From the nearest neighbor list, take a majority vote, but you can have a whole bunch of different aggregation functions, right? You can weight the vote according to their distance, right? Or do some other things. So one thing that's interesting, right? So it's the Kenyan neighbor classifier, the K, uh, it's actually a constant, right? It's actually a hyperparameter that you can actually tune, right? For different type of K, you could have different uh, predictions for this test example. So how to use that inside the database, right? So if you go to my lab, this is uh, what you can do. So essentially, right, what you are going to have is, okay, so I have the training data, right? So in this case, right? So it's a relation. Uh, the first attribute is the ID of all those examples. The second attribute in this case, are uh, actually the, the, the attributes, the, the features, yeah, based on which you are going to make a prediction, okay? So here you can see, we actually invite all those points into a two-dimensional space. And then you have the third attribute, which is the label. Right, so they are actually uh, the ground truth for your prediction. So you have one relation contains your training data, and then you could actually uh, try to uh, then prepare some test data. Right, in this case, you have the test data, which are another relation. The first attribute is the ID. The second attribute are those features. Right. So, but for testing, do not have label because I want to make prediction of all those examples. Give me the label. I, I don't know the label. And then to run this Kenyan's neighbor thing, right? So what the thing can do is there's a function inside mylib called mylib.kn, right? So it, you give it the training data. This is the name of the relation containing the training data. You give the colon contains all the features. You give the ID, right? The colon all contains ID and the column contains the label, right? So this actually specify how to understand this training site, right? And then you say, yeah, I want to make prediction, right? 
So this is actually the test data. Uh, region contains the test data. Uh, and uh, this is uh, all the features or attributes you want to make a prediction on, right? So this is the ID of the, of the test data. And then you can say, yeah, output the result into a different table, different relation, right? You can say, I want to do three nearest neighbor, my k equals to three, right? Uh, and some other things. This is the distance. I want to compute the distance between those examples. For example, using Euclidean distance, for example. So, and you can do this, right? Once you do this, it's going to generate a new relation, which is kn result classification right here, contains all the results. And if you query this relation inside database, right? you will get something that looks like this. If you look at what we have, essentially every single example in the test set uh, has one corresponding tuple here, right? Fourth attribute ID followed by features. And then this is the third attribute. It's a prediction that the system make, right? This is uh, in the previous day, right? So you do not have the, the, the prediction for the test data, right? So now, right, for every single test example, right? You start to have this prediction. Right. And then there are some other information, right? For example, which example in the training side is my nearest neighbor, right? What is distance, right? Between those examples, so on and so forth. So as you can see, right? So inside a database, if you have the classification task, if you do Kenyan's neighbor classifier, right? It's just one thing very similar to a SQL query, then you can get some type of prediction out of your data, right? Which is actually very powerful. And there are a whole bunch of other things you can do. There's uh, so many different uh, like machine learning models that you can start to run inside your database today, right? So whenever you are building a data intensive application and have one of those inside extraction tasks, right? So like you could copy your data into a machine learning system, but, but, but for some simple things, you can also run them uh, inside your database system without moving your data around. Because the moment you start to move your data around, you start to have a whole bunch of security and privacy issues. You start to have performance issues. You start to have uh, duplication of your data. You need to maintain consistency between different copies. You need to maintain updates, right? So between different copies. So it becomes a little bit nice in the real world. So, all, so, so, so one thing people now not often do, but sometimes do is actually try to run this within the database system. So again, right, so content of this lecture will not be in the exam, right? So the probably the only lecture is not, not going to, to be in the, in the exam. Um, but the goal is really try to make sure you understand you can do a whole bunch of things uh, inside database. So this is one question. What are the example of applications uh, that use clustering? Oh, there's a whole bunch of those, right? So I mean, clustering, you can use them to actually understand uh, what you have like inside 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 your data, right? Because I don't have label, so it's not predictive, right? So what one thing you can do is, uh, for example, uh, you have you are running a hospital, right? Uh, and then you have a whole bunch of patients. Um, and uh, one thing you can do is you can actually try to cluster them together, right? Once you're cluster, you know ah within each cluster they are actually similar, right? And then you can actually try to look at uh, each of the clusters. Right. So once you have the cluster, you can actually try to reason about uh, the property of that cluster, actually looking at it. Right. So this is like one example. Another example you can do is you can also use clustering, for example, as some way to summarize your data. Okay. So I have a couple, uh, like, a, like a billion of like a patients, for example. Right. And then, yeah, I cannot deal with all of them. Right. So let me try to cluster them together, right, to actually summarize my data into a few clusters. And then I reason at the level of a cluster instead of every single uh, kind, of, kind of example level, right? So these are the two, yeah, two examples about how to use clustering. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think next year, right, so when you are taking your machine learning course, you are going to learn more about uh, why people are doing that. Yeah. But the point of today is, if you want to do clustering, if your data happens to be inside database, do not copy that out and run that elsewhere. So you are able to do that inside the system that we talk about in this course today. Okay. Okay. Great. So that's all. Um, so there's another question: Is under overfitting an issue when choosing low to large value for k in clustering and classification? Are there a solution to predetermine an optimal value for k? So this is actually a very interesting question. 
about how to pick K for uh, I assume you mean uh, K means or you mean K nearest neighbor? Which K are you talking about? Yeah, so, okay, okay, yeah, for, yeah, for, okay, so like for, uh, for Kenya's neighbor, right? So there, there are two parts of this. Uh, there are two parts of the answer. The first one is what does the theory tell us? Okay. So in theory, there is the optimal choice of K. Uh, and uh, that probably, I mean, I mean, in a big old sense, uh, it's, a, it's a function about how many data examples you have and, uh, and underlying distribution and the smoothness, right? So in principle, right? So if you know your data generation process, you know how data generated, you know the underlying distribution, you should pick, you should be able to compute optimal K at least in a big old sense. But in practice, that's not always practical, actually, often not, uh, yeah, yeah, probably like, like almost always not practical. So what people often do uh, is to treat K as a hyperparameter, okay? So we have a training set, we have a test set, we could have another validation set. You can actually try a whole bunch of K and pick the best one, right? On the validation set and you apply it to your test set, right? So that's what people often do in practice. But there are, there's actually a huge chunk of deep theory uh, about what is optimal K, right? And there are also different notions about what optimal really means. So for K means, uh, yeah, I don't think there's a good choice there. <laughs> um, so what people often do is uh, try a whole bunch of those and see which other makes sense. Or if you do not want to do that, there's a whole bunch of other methods that does not rely on the predefined K about how many clusters that you are going to have, okay? If you really do not know how many clusters you have, try those methods, yeah. Make sense? Okay, any other questions? Okay, anyway, yeah, for all of this, I'm sure you are going to learn way more in your, except the associated rule manual, that's called database. But for clustering and classification, uh, I'm sure you are going to learn way more in your machine learning course, right? The goal of this lecture is to make sure you understand not only you can write a single query inside database, you can write a whole bunch of fascinating things inside database too today, okay? So that's all for today, right? So that's the last lecture before the Easter break. Have a great Easter break. When we get back, we are going to open up this database system and learn how to build it, okay? Yeah. So if you have any question, I'll be here to answer them. Otherwise, I will see you in two weeks. Yeah, any questions? Any questions about this lecture, about all the other lectures, right? So I'm here to, to answer. Yeah. Okay, so if there's no other questions, and uh, yeah, see you guys after the Easter break. <laughs>